I'm Timothy Jackson, and I teach ethics in the Department of Religious Studies here at Stanford. I'm the moderator for the debate tonight, the debate sponsored by Table Talk, who I thank, on the topic of evolution, science, or dogma. And let me first say a few words about the format, then I'll introduce our speakers. There will be two opening statements, each of 25 minutes, and then two rebuttal periods, each of 10 minutes. After that, we'll open it up to the floor for questions. If you have a question, proceed, if you will, to one of the mics in either aisle, and I'll acknowledge you and then try to direct it to the party most relevant to that question. Our speakers tonight are first to my left, Professor William Provine, who is a professor of the history of the philosophy of science and the biological sciences at Cornell. And to my right is Professor Philip Johnson, who's a professor of law at the University of California, Berkeley, written on criminal law. And uh, <laughs> no hissing, please. But, uh, and also the author of the book Darwin on trial. We'll begin first with Professor Johnson. I think, th uh, I think they'll be moving a few things as I start. Don't let that distract you, and it won't distract me. This is, I think, the fourth time that Will Provine and I have met in debate, uh, the other three times being uh, at Cornell University, uh, two of them in front of his class in evolutionary biology. Uh, so I feel qualified to say where we will tend to agree and where we'll tend to disagree during this debate. First, where we agree. Uh, Will Provine and I agree that the modern neo-Darwinian theory of evolution is fundamentally inconsistent with any meaningful theism, with any meaningful uh, God who acts as a creator of the world. Now, of course, this isn't necessarily true of uh, all theories of evolution or of the concept of evolution broadly construed because uh, a creator god could make use of a gradual, long-term process of making one thing out of another just as well as any other process. So there's nothing about the word evolution that rules out the creator. But the modern neo-Darwinian theory of evolution, that is to say the orthodox view among today's scientists, insists that evolution is an unplanned, undirected process. It combines elements of chance, and necessity, or natural law, that is to say, a combination of random genetic changes or mutations which are accumulated through natural selection. Uh, these are impersonal material forces reflecting no pre-existing intelligence and no guidance, so that human beings, as the outcome of this process, are essentially an unplanned accident of nature. Now, it's evolution in that sense that we're talking about and evolution as a comprehensive theory of the history of life, of how we and other living things came into existence. The implication of evolutionary biology in that, that sense is perhaps not exactly that God does not exist. It'd be more accurate to say that if God does exist, existing is about the only thing that God has ever done. Uh, God is permanently unemployed, has never found useful employment in the entire history of life because impersonal material forces were capable of doing the whole job and did do it. Uh, so if one attempts to hold a view of God as creator, uh, it is a very attenuated view and one which tends to uh, fade away into unreality. Now, I would agree with Will Provine on this, but I would tend to stress more than the conclusions of evolutionary biology that a theistic picture of the world is fundamentally inconsistent with the manner of thinking that evolutionary biologists have employed to reach their conclusions. That is to say, contemporary evolutionary biology, like much else in science, is based on the premise that nature is all there is. It is based on a premise of metaphysical naturalism. One assumes that at the beginning uh, there was nothing but matter in mindless motion. It follows from this starting point assumption 
that impersonal, unintelligent, purposeless forces must have been capable of doing all the work of creation because there wasn't anything else. Purpose and intelligence could not come into existence on the basis of these assumptions until they evolved through unintelligent and purposeless processes. Now, this way of thinking